Hello, and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 32, Give Me an F, putting the F in FLGS. From Hamilton, Ontario, I'm Sean, and here with me, live from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start here live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop and continue on even after the double bell ends the show for more Off the Books After Show. Uh, just a quick reminder that we've swapped up the order of the show. Now you'll be getting the main topic much sooner. For those of you who enjoy our reviews and weekly look back at the games we played, they're just going to be after the main topic and any announcements or reviews. So today, after the main topic, I've got two reviews. I've got the role-playing game Shadow of the Demon Lord, and I've got the board game Jim Henson's Labyrinth. Uh, for Tabletop Gaming Weekly, I've got some more expansions to the DC Deck Builder. And I've got Dinosaur Island with Totally Liquid and more Zaya with all the bells and whistles. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. We're here for you, and we want to talk and interact. Each week, we're going to highlight some of those discussions. Feedback we've received, comments on our content, gaming discussions we've been part on, and so on. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hit us up on social media, where I can be found, this here, everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And I can be found as Dark Elf LX. Up first, Josh James talked about one of his own flying the flag moments. Wore my never spill, split the party shirt to town today. I occasionally get positive comments from people who get the reference. It's always good to meet a fellow gamer, and this is often the easiest way. Uh, that's awesome, Josh. That's exactly what the point of our episode was, right? Fly, fly the flag with pride. Great way to meet other gamers. Now, Brock left a comment on the actual blog post about that saying, I've got a geek on Ultimate Backpack or Ultimate Board Game Backpack, and not only is it amazing, it's a great topic of conversation, both at the game club and non-gaming settings. Well, thanks, Brock. Now, I have to say that's one serious backpack. No wonder it gets people talking. The link for it's in the chat. Uh, I considered commenting on the price, but then I realized I've got $200 plus camera backpacks that seem to share a lot of features in common, so I'm not really one to talk. Hey, you protect what you love, right? Yeah. Uh, now, Steven Anderson writes, As a kid in the 70s and 80s, I frequented four types of stores. Bookstores, model shops, computer stores, and gaming stores. All four at that time were tiny, out-of-the-way places. No one ever even heard of them except us geeks. Now everyone has a computer, reads books on their Kindle, and calls themselves a D&D player. Depressing. I'm going to go build a full-scale model of the USS Enterprise. <laughs> well, thanks for the co comment, Stefan. Um, I got to ask, though, why is it so depressing? Like, personally, I think it's awesome that gaming has become more mainstream. It means more gamers, and that means more great games getting published and more people to play them with. Like, I get it. It used to feel, I don't know, special, right? But it doesn't make any of the games any less fun. We record the show live Wednesday nights at 9.30 Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. Don't forget... If you're here live, we continue the show after the double bell in an off-the-books after show, as well as some special features that might make it on YouTube. Thanks to our moderator, Angie Games. Tonight in the chat, we have uh, Brian, Poncho, and Shadzar all chatting. Shadzar is pointing out that uh, if the backpack doesn't unfold with a functioning table, it isn't ultimate. <laughs> That's a good point. When you're paying that much, <laughs> that, that, that might be. I, I bet you there's one out there. Now I'm wondering. That's something we might have to check. Maybe yeah, NG yeah, Games yeah. can look it up. It's see if there is a, a, a folding game table that you can bring with you to game night. Because that's why we always bring the games, and there's usually other gamers. We don't always have the table. Absolutely. There we go. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Shadzar's warning that we can't get him started on the everyone play, says play D&D &D thing, because like Anshi, he will have to stop talking until the stream goes explicit. <laughs> 
our chat room, I think, is probably always explicit at this point. I don't know if it's as offensive <laughs> to read it. We make sure to try to keep the actual audio podcast as uh, at least PG rated. There we go. And now we know what we can design and sell on Kickstarter. The table backpack. Go. Very true. Very true. Yeah. So our main topic tonight is going to be about game stores. We are talking about local game stores, hobby shops, the place you go to play games. And so I got a call out to the chat, something for you guys to talk about while we're going on to the main topic. So think about what makes your personal local game stores so special. I want to hear some specific examples. Tell us about what your store does right. Most episodes, we look to answer one or more of your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Of course, social media works as well. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Well, the best way for our questions to come through is through the website. It's a little easier to track them that way. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. This week is all about local game stores. And what differentiates a good one from a bad one? Today we're talking about putting the F in FLGS. Now this topic comes from a question from the Tabletop Bellhop patron, P.S. Grujol, who wrote, I have a topic suggestion for the show. Whenever we travel day trip, we try to visit one of the local game stores in whatever city we're in. 401 Games in Vaughan was impressive. Mm -hmm. This past weekend we were in Detroit, and the store we visited was sadly disappointing. I guess we're spoiled here in Windsor with that gem Brinstone Games. A friend has since suggested that we check out Guild of Blades in Detroit on our next visit. Just wondering if you and Sean can discuss game stores and any gems you've discovered in southern Ontario and our surroundings. Well, I'll start off by saying Deanna and I do the exact same thing uh, as Goujon. Whenever we're taking a trip out of town, one of the first things I'm going to do is uh, Google Game Store and Hobby Shop and the name of the town. Like, I love discovering awesome new game stores in other cities. Now, P.S. Goujon obviously is local to Windsor based on his question. And while it's awesome to hear from a local, I realize that most of you, our listeners and viewers, are not from around here. So while I am going to list some of the great local stores, what I want to do first is talk about exactly what makes a good game store. One of the first things, the most absolutely vital things that can make or break that F, friendly, knowledgeable staff. Yeah, th this, I, I have to say, should be a given, right? Any retail outlet, game store or not. But man, far too often I have entered a game store only to find a single staff member sitting behind a counter or behind a PC or a laptop looking bored who doesn't even acknowledge I've entered the store. Like, even more frequently, I'll enter a store and the staff is so busy doing something, whether it's playing a game, reading a book, streaming something online, whatever it is, they don't even notice I've walked in. Now, when this happens, I got to admit, if it's not a store I frequent all the time, I'm tempted to just turn around and leave. And I'm not even going to get into the reactions Deanna gets sometimes, especially if she walks into a store by herself. Now, I get that you and your staff probably opened the store as a hobby, and you probably did it because you love games, and maybe you did it because you're trying to save some money and get some good prices for yourself and your friends. That is honestly how a lot of game stores start. But get some retail training. Honestly, it wouldn't be a bad thing. When people come in, greet them. Ask if they need help. Point them in the direction of whatever they may be looking for. Offer to help. It's amazing how far a friendly hi can go. Even just that. You don't need to open with a, can I help you with anything? But a simple welcome and a glance to see if the customer might want to ask about something will go a long way. Do you know the customer? Are they a regular? If there are new customers in your store and you welcome someone by name, that can mm -hmm. make the entire store and environment see, seem, wait for it, friendly. Very true. You want your game store to be cheers, right? Like, I'm, again, talking to our older audience <laughs> at this point. But when you walk in, norm, right? When everyone does that at the games, I'll admit that happens to me. So maybe I'm just biased in that way. But it does. It feels good. You walk in, and it's like, hey, how's it going? Say hi. Be friendly. Now, besides being friendly, there's another part to this. Your staff should know the product. Now, I'm not saying you need to know every game out there. That's obviously impossible. And they don't even need to know every type of game in the store. But have some general knowledge. Like, you should know what's hot 
in pretty much all types of games the store covers. Like, what's what's the latest RPG coming out? What, what's the big hotness? Of course, that's Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Big press release just went out today, right? What's the top game on Board Game Geek right now? Well, that's Gloomhaven. What's everyone talking about? Wingspan. Like, these are the kind of things your staff should know. What's the latest card and the latest Magic release? Oh, see, to be honest, here's one I don't know. But hopefully someone else at the store does. Or I've got a little note saying, hey, if people are asking about magic, this is what's hot. Absolutely. And uh, and actually, when it comes to hotness, uh, Gloomhaven is losing out. Uh, the, new, uh, the new expansion of uh, Terraforming Mars is the hotness. The okay. hotness. So I was looking at number one game. The yeah. number one game is still Gloomhaven. I was thinking yeah. of that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, so this will, of course, be will vary by market, but there has to be some knowledge. Weekly printing out of that BGG hot list and tacking mm -hmm. it up by the cash register can go a long way to help your employees just be that much more informed when talking to a customer. Very true. Now, next up, it's okay to know about the games, but have you got a good game selection to sell? Yeah, this is another one where I've been to far too many stores that seem to think just having a handful of games on hand, like one one shelf or less, is okay because, well, we can order in anything you want. I'm sorry, the ability to order in anything you want isn't good enough. I've got that right here in front of me right now. I can go online and order anything I want myself, and it'll come right to my house. I can do that. Uh, people want to pick up things. They want to turn them over in their hands. They want to read the back of the book or flip to the back of the box. Even better, have an open copy of the hottest games for people to look at. Or take it to the next step and have a demo copy available that people can play. Though I am getting a bit ahead of myself with that one. For me, a good, friendly local game store is going to stock a mix of the new hotness and tried and true classics. They're going to use sites like Board Game Geek to see what the buzz is about, and they're going to stock the top-ranked games. They also have an RPG selection that includes more than just Dungeons & Dragons. Seeing a shelf full of digest-sized indie RPGs that includes way more than D&D &D just makes me happy. That, to me, shows that the store is paying attention to what's actually going on in the role-playing scene and have looked beyond the hotness of, say, Critical Role. I want to see more miniatures than just Warhammer. I want to see Magic, but I should also see other card games like Force of Will, other lesser-known games. Again, know your market, but at the same time, don't be afraid to try and stretch your market. Just because you live in Dubois, Wyoming, doesn't mean someone there might not want to play the latest Kids on Bikes RPG game. Uh, so, the other thing I personally like to find in a game store is used games. Uh, many of us nowadays are gaming on a budget, myself included, and it's nice to be able to save money by buying slightly used gaming stuff. Now, many stores I've seen do this on commission, so what they're doing is selling stuff from the local gaming community, but then other stores just sell off their old game libraries and demo copies. We talked earlier about opening up a game to show it off. Well, once you're done with that, sell off the copy at a slight discount. Now, next up... How do you create a market for what you are selling? Give people, wait for it, a place to play. Yeah, every store. I Honestly, even if all you want is people to come into your store, buy a game, and get out, they should at least have one table. A table they can use to show off games and do demos on. To me, that's enough. For like one of those big warehouse style stores, there's more and more of these popping up. There's one we're going to mention later, JJ Cards and Comics, as a Canadian example. But like there's um, Miniature Market, cool stuff is like this, right? They have these huge, like massive stores that are basically Costco for gaming. Even those stores should have that one table at least just to show off a game. Take it to the next level. Like, that's a warehouse-style store. If you want a friendly local game store, if you want people in your place, you want to be a local community, you want to be a hub, you want your local game store to be better than that. You want it to be a place to meet other gamers and actually play games. Like, it should be the modern version of the, the Roman Forum, a big meeting place, a community hub. You can't have all that when all you have is shelves of games. That goes back to previous episode creeping people in the aisles when they grab the right kind of game, right? You don't want that. Sean's very vocal about that in our, uh, I don't know if texting means vocal, in one of our Express episodes. But in general, you want tables, and the more tables and chairs, the better. Though I got one little note, make those chairs comfortable. Too many times I've been in a game store, sat down to play some games, and after the first round, I'm ready to go because the chairs kind of suck. Uh, added to that, it's all the stuff we talked about before with venues. The gaming space should be well lit. 
Um, another one seems like a given, but I've been in a few stores where the gaming space, like hidden away in the back dark halls of the store or in the basement where it's all unfinished and there's just a couple pot lights. I, it's almost like an afterthought sometimes that like, oh, we got to put a table somewhere. Like I know the whole gamers playing in their mom's basement's a meme. Don't perpetuate that at your store. Your gaming area should be bright, clean and welcoming. So this is one more thing, okay? You've got your great play space, right? This is kicking up to the next level. This isn't something I expect every local game store to have, but it definitely um, makes it a better store by having it. Uh, that is have the stuff needed to play games on hand. I know this sounds a little odd, but what I mean is have dice, right? Like if you have RPG events, have sets of RPG dice people can play. You get a new person in your store and they're all excited about D&D and then they're like, oh, I want to play. And you're like, oh, Dave's starting a game in about an hour if you want to hang around you can play and then you try to sell them dice that's just no don't do that give them a set of dice to play and then after the game they hey you want to take those home you can have them for five bucks that's totally up to you but have stuff like that have pencils pens uh scraps of paper if you run miniature games every good warhammer store gaming store that has miniatures have some scenery on hand even if it's not the best looking stuff in the world doesn't have to be amazing perfectly painted just some functional scenery uh play mats three by three space mats for games like x-wing or Mata, um, card mats for collectible card game players to use because no one seems to like actually putting their cards on tables anymore. Um, measuring tapes, range rulers, all that stuff, right? I've even seen stores that have a DM screen that's public use, right? If you're running D&D, you can go up and borrow the store screen and Another local store actually has copies, uh, a store copy of the core rule books for the, the most popular games played in the store, D&D and Pathfinder, where if one of your players forgets his player's handbook at home, you can let him use it. Or again, if you have that new player who showed up excited about D&D, excuse me, excited about D&D, you can have them work, a, work along, read along, use the book. Now, again, none of this is required, but it just it kicks it up that next notch. So much of this will be determined by your space and costs, your employees, hours, and more. But remember, these things can help drive customer demand. If the customers aren't asking for it, is it because they don't even know it's an option? And once they know, why not help them win stuff with organized play and events? Yeah, I guess every store should have a schedule, right, somewhere of what happens in their store. Hopefully both physically in the store, like a nice big calendar, easy to see, but nowadays also online. I should be able to go on your Facebook page, your web page, and see what's happening Thursday nights. And then that schedule really should be filled. Like almost every day, in my opinion, should be filled with awesome gaming stuff that patrons can take part in. Like I want to, and I want to see a mix of different stuff. I want to see different types of stuff, right? I, I know Friday is going to say Friday and Magic. It's a given. That's fine. I accept that. I have no problem with that. Magic players have fun. Make that store lots of money so they don't close. I should also see D and D Adventures League nowadays. Like everyone's playing D and D, right? Isn't that what we talked about earlier? Everyone's a D and D player. Well, give them somewhere to play. Adventures League is the organized play system that is currently going on for by Wizards of the Coast. Those are, are, like, to me, the bare minimum. And I don't play D&D or Magic, and I still expect stores to have those. What I want to see, though, are board game nights. I want to see open game nights where people can bring their own stuff in. I want to see other RPGs than just D&D. Yes, Pathfinder counts. It, it's a different one, but I'd love to see more than just those two games. I want to see miniature games. I want to see painting clinics. I want to see learn to DM settings. I want to see all this stuff. Stuff should be going on almost every day of the week. Now, many popular games actually have organized play programs. Now, those include swag and other promotional items. These are the kind of things that I'm surprised more stores don't seem to take part in. Like, gamers love getting new stuff for their games, upgraded components, variant art cards, etc. They're always hugely popular and often part of these programs. And a good store is going to try to support these kind of things. If the local players are playing X-Wing, you should have X-Wing tournaments. And don't forget, many of these organized events get stuff to the store for the store too. Swag, free advertising, and game-related publications, even, which can mm -hmm. help drive traffic to the store. So really, it's good for everyone. Yeah. But what do people play on those other nights? Demo copies? Maybe a game library? Yeah. One of the best ways to sell someone a game is to have them see it, touch it, and if possible, play it. 
if there's some new hot game that everyone's talking about, I honestly think there should be a copy of that game set up in the store front and center, ready to be talked about and potentially demoed on the spot. One of the best companies I saw do this actually is Privateer Press when they were launching War Machine Mark II, sent retailers this little stand-up 3x3 three three cardboard box, a set some miniatures and a set of sample rules that the stores were supposed to set up in the center of the store. You walked in and saw this with these nice painted miniatures and it just made you want to play. That's the kind of thing I want to see. And then once that game fades from hotness, whether that's two days later or a month later, you either add that to a growing in-store game library made up of all these hot games over the years, or months or weeks, or sold off at a discount. We talked about sales. Like, knock five bucks off the price. It's never been, it's, it's been played a couple times, as long as you don't break anything. If that's not an option for you, maybe donate it, right? Local libraries and schools are always looking for games. Like, I honestly think there's very little reason that stores shouldn't be doing demos of games and have in-store gaming libraries. Because added to opening up your own copies, many game companies are more than happy to provide you with demo copies of games free of charge or at a pretty steep discount. Even better, more and more companies like Stronghold Games does this will send people to your store to do the demoing for you. So you don't even have to have an employee tied up tying, showing off the games. This is something a good game store is going to look into and take advantage of. Now again, one extra step here that I often find lacking in many stores though, this is the, the follow-up, right? It's uh, the full loop, bring it full circle. If you do have a demo library, if you do have demo copies, if you do have a game library for people to use, you have to maintain those games. Far too often, stores are like, yeah, yeah, we got to have demos. So they open up a bunch of games at once, or they open them over time, and they stick them on a shelf. And then when people come in, they're like, oh, look at our huge game library, go play games. And then you get over there, and you open up the box, and like three of the pieces are missing, or the rules aren't in there, or it, the box is ripped, the pieces are broken. And it ends up that many of the games in that library are unplayable. A good store is going to maintain those games and keep them in good shape as well as police the people using the games to make sure they're treating them properly. Proactive care is going to be much easier for both players and employees. Does the staff dread that once-a-year cleanup, just like they dread that annual inventory that has to happen? Making sure that everything is good when the game goes back is quick and saves a lot of headaches in the long run. Now, there's nothing like cleanliness. Now, of all the things I've said or are given, like there's been at least three. To me, this is the most. Like your store should be clean, the entire store. Though I'm not just talking about like the nice front. You polish up the front floor, like the back room that you can see through that open door. That should be clean too. The washrooms, like you better have washrooms, please. And none of that. You have to buy something to use them. Come on, especially if you're expecting people to game in your store. Uh, the, the washrooms should be spotless. They should be one of the cleanest parts of the store. Behind your counter should be clean and not cluttered. Floors, you know, if you have a carpet, vacuum it now and then. If it's not, mop it. it like, this is a thing. Uh, stock, dust it. I definitely, I picked up some older modules. Garbage is emptied. Like, it, it's sad that you should have to say this, but I've been in far too many stores that just, like, dirty, dingy, dusty, smelly are terms that describe far too many stores far too often. Now, unfortunately, there are locations which are take advan taken advantage of by unsavory persons who are not and will not be customers. There are usually reasons why stores choose to go to a you-have-to-buy-something policy for washrooms, and it's very rarely greed. However, do your best to ensure that your customers, even if they aren't your customers right then and there, mm -hmm. are made welcome. Uh, you know, your, your employees should know the difference between, you know... The, the random people off the street and the customers who, you know, support your store and make mm -hmm. you an ongoing, uh, ongoing profit. So, one of the reasons why stores have to make things clean is food and drink. Yeah, to me, this is, this is a must. If you expect people to hang around your store for hours, so you've got your great gaming area and you've done all this work and you've got all your Warhammer scenery and you set up a big apocalypse game that's going to take six hours, you better have snacks there for those people to eat. Like, to me, basic snacks and canned drinks can be enough. That's fine. Just have something there. I don't need my game store to have a full cafe in it. Though I got to admit, that is a bonus if there is one. Though the one thing to watch for is the kinds of food. 
I don't want all junk food and sugary beverages. Yes, it's a stereotype that all gamers ingest are Doritos and Mountain Dew. And yes, I've met many gamers who stick to chips, chocolate bars, and pop when gaming. I'll admit, at one time, that was me. But there are those of us who are actually trying to eat healthier nowadays. Bottled water should be available. And I gotta admit, the best stores I've been in do this one for free. And snacks should include some healthier choices, like kind bars, baby carrots, rice crackers, baked chips, etc. Just not all just Doritos and Cheetos. Now, another thing I like to see is when stores realize you're going to be gaming and eating at the same time, and thus avoid things like those Cheetos and smart food and other powdery snacks, and avoid greasy, saucy foods. Now, even our local store doesn't do this, um... The way it was described, why, what the type of food they serve is fat guy food. Uh, it has nothing to do with how good it is for gaming. But what's nice there is they have a separate eating area. So that the games and the food are generally kept apart. Yes, you can eat while gaming, but it is possible to step aside, have a meal, wash your hands, and return back to the game. Now, how you go about this is very dependent on many things yeah. in your location, not the least of which is space. And, quite possibly, depending on your location, health department inspections. Yes, there is. It's an interesting one, actually. We One of our local game stores is Half Game Store, Half Game Cafe, and they are, they're independently owned. But they're also independently licensed. And if I want to walk in with a Tim Hortons or I want to stop at McDonald's before going in, besides something I wouldn't do because there's a game cafe right there and support them. But say I was the type of person who would just walk in with outside food, you have to keep that on the game store side. If you go to the cafe side, you can get in trouble. Like they'll, they'll politely ask you to move back over, but you can't have outside food in the cafe part because it is considered a restaurant. So that's the ones I have. Those are my suggestions for what I think changes a local game store into a friendly local game store. So, before we uh, move on, I want to stop in. We've had a lot of chat in the, uh, in the lobby about uh, what's going on. And uh, people are talking about things like, you know, whiteboards for your DMs, if you've got Ooh, the space for it. Um, a poster for turns of game. So, if you've got a game that's getting played there all the time, have a poster up of your, term, of your turn order so people don't have to deal with little, you know, that's reminder cards. Idea. If you want to uh, introduce new people to the game, hey, what are the, what's the turn order for Magic? Well, there it is, right there on the wall. That's cool. Uh, you know, little options like that. Um, and uh, if, you're, if your employees are saying, look it up on YouTube when it comes to DMing, painting, Ooh. and minis... Ouch. That's not a friendly local game store. And that's when I point at their game shelf and go, yeah, after I look that up on Amazon. Like, yeah. come on. If you're going to send me the internet, I'm going to go to the internet. Yeah. Uh, Poncho's saying that uh, his Parma, Ohio FLGS is a great selection, but the prices are way too high. Uh, he'd love to support local, but, you know, if they're milking him for prices, it, it becomes a little tougher. Yeah, so I, that was something I purposely avoided on this list. I personally do not think competitive prices are necessary for a good FLGS. Yes, that is a good bonus. Yes, that is something that might get me to stop at a store. But to me, it's not a necessary thing. Because a good FLGS is going to do all those other things I just talked about, which may make those increased prices worth more, worth it to you. Now, I know it may make. That's on a pace-by-pace -pace basis. Everyone's got a different budget. No one should overspend on their budget for gaming. Gaming is a hobby. Your kids need to eat. You need a house over your head, a roof over your head. That's all way more important than us playing games. Playing games is a hobby. If you can't afford it, you do what you got to do to be able to play. Now, if you can afford it and your store does support all that stuff above, that's where I don't mind paying a bit more. I got to admit, I really don't like it when stores gouge, where they overprice on something because they're like, ooh, Gloomhaven's not being reprinted for three months, so we're going to charge 300 bucks. To me, that's something that could knock off that F. But overall, pricing and FLGS is that that's a, a topic that's been going on for a very long time and not one I really want to delve into. So that's basically my thoughts on it is some stores, if they do the extra effort, are worth paying a bit more for. And then finally, Poncho notes that he works for Frito-Lay, so he encourages Doritos and Cheetos <laughs> at game night. Works for Dorito-Lay. That, that sounds like a hookup <laughs> we might have there. We, we could use some snacks for extra life. All right. I've been so, to Parma. There was there was a game store I went to in Parma that was awesome, where they it was all big long comic book style boxes that they had all their RPGs in, and I found some out of print stuff. I have no idea what that was called though. That was years ago. <laughs> and now getting back to PS's questions about great local game stores in southwestern Ontario. 
All right, so the, the big story I've mentioned many times in this uh, with the positive stuff, not that Kernji did dirty stuff. There's a place called the CG Realm for the card game realm. Uh, that's right here in Windsor, Ontario. It's half game store, half sandwich shop. Great selection of RPGs, ton of indie stuff. Like uh, there's one guy there, Ian, is obviously into indie RPGs, very knowledgeable about them, and like he gets in obscure weird stuff. Like that's one of the first places I saw Tales from the Loop, Kids on Bikes, huge Savage Worlds collection, awesome. Uh, they carry all the collectible card games pretty much. Um, they do miniatures, War Machine, uh, Warhammer. They also do stuff like Guild Ball. X-Wings played there every weekend, other stuff like that. Uh, it's a pretty large but not amazing board game selection, not the best I've seen. Staff is very friendly and knowledgeable. Uh, something that's awesome to see is they're very LGBTQ plus friendly, including having a weekly gamers night, G-A-Y-M-E-R-S, gamers night. I gotta say, it's they do have also the best prices in the city. The Windsor Sandwich Shop is the place we always talk about the Coney Dogs, so you know how much I love that place. <laughs> So for a trip over to the border, since Goujon mentioned uh, Detroit, if you go a little further, I think it's west to Livonia, Michigan, there is a stop called RIW Hobbies and Games. Uh, this and other generic stores, and they cover everything. RPGs, board games, miniatures, card games. Very impressive board game selection, uh, just like I want. I, a mix of the new hotness with classics. Archie, Ar, yeah, RPG support, though, seems sadly limited to D&D and Pathfinder. Uh, I have seen a couple other things there, but it's like kind of flash in the pan. Like probably there's some local guy that asked them to get it in. Uh, they do weekly board game nights, Magic, Pathfinder, Yu-Gi-Oh! Uh, organized play. The biggest thing that I was impressed by, which isn't going to impress everyone, is their selection of miniatures. Wow, like a wall. Uh, what's also cool is the owners of the store run the local library game night, which is a nice touch. Now, heading north in Ontario, I've got L.A. Mood Comics and Games in London. Uh, Well-trained, knowledgeable staff. Lots of cool geeky stuff because it's also a comic shop. Uh, the thing I like, though, is they sell used games on commission and have a great, great selection of used products. Now, board games, so-so. Uh, it's, it's mostly hot and popular items. Decent enough. RPG selection's pretty good. They have some indie stuff, not a lot of other stuff. Uh, not very card-focused. Like, I think they do magic and stuff like that, but like they don't have the huge wall of singles and glass cases. So to me, that's just kind of a nice change. Uh, the secret, though, here's the, the hidden gem part, is you go in the door to L.A. Mood, right next to that is another door, not well labeled, that heads to the basement, and that is where their gaming area is. Now, i got to say, it's not the nicest gaming area. It looks and smells and feels like a basement, but man, they have all the used stuff down there. You will find comic boxes after comic boxes of used RPG stuff, all discount price. Last time I was there, someone must have brought in their entire collection of Paranoia 2nd Edition. Every book was two bucks each. This is where I filled out my collection of Mekton. It's also where I found some Merp books. Like This is the classic hard-to-find stuff just sitting there in a comic book box. Now, speaking of you stuff found in London, a call out. Now, this isn't a game store to City Lights Bookshop. City Lights is probably one of the best bookstores I've ever been in in my life. This place is amazing. But they have one bookcase right across from the counter that's RPG stuff. And you got to check it out. They have some of the like this is another one it's all used but like you find gems and they don't overprice them. So last time I was there, I actually got a copy of the Marvel Saga system. Uh, which was the one that was originally released for Dragonlance. And this is a card-based role-playing game that many people have told me is the best superhero game ever written. I found a complete box set with all the cards for 20 bucks. Over the years, I bought a ton of RPGs there. Like, huge shout-out for City Lights. Not just for, like, if you want books, too, or comics, uh, anime. Like, just awesome, eclectic shop. Uh, LPs upstairs, that's something new they've added. Interestingly, although I, I, I love City Lights, and I will never, never complain about making a trip to City Lights. Uh, now, I don't actually know if they have anything gaming related, but you were, you were saying City Lights is the best used bookshop. I have to say, the best used bookshop I have ever been to is actually across the river in Detroit. Uh, John King Books. Oh, you mentioned that. With over a million books in stock. Wow. It is a giant old Detroit it looks. I mean, it looks like it could have been. An, it looks like it could be a Detroit Library building, um, but their used book, used and rare book selection is phenomenal. That's where I picked up one of my classics for my collection, a 1924 stage lighting guide. 
Um, and I mean, it was like five bucks. <laughs> so wow. it's, you just, it's one of those, you can walk for days and get lost in like this three story used bookstore. So John King books used in rare books. Uh, if you're, if you're looking for just bookstore fun in Detroit. There you go. Yeah, Eugene's mentioned that one to me. I, how we took multiple days to see the whole store. Oh yeah. No, it's, which is it's impressive. Insane. Yep. So earlier when I was talking about types of stores, I talked about these warehouse style stores for locally. Well, it's not really local to me anymore. It's much, I think it's even more local to Sean. It's closer to his end of on, on Southwest Ontario is J and J cards and collectibles in Kitchener Waterloo, technically Waterloo, half of the Kitchener Waterloo area. I've never quite understood that. If I lived in that area, maybe I'd understand it better. But anyway, this place is massive. It's, it's basically a Costco for gaming. Uh, it's the best selection you're going to find anywhere nearby. It's like walking into an Amazon store. Due to the volume they sell, they also have great prices. Now, according to their owners, I didn't see this. They corrected me on Facebook. I guess they do have snacks, and they do have a couple demo tables, though I don't know where they were. I didn't see them when I was there. Uh, but they were set up. It, it, it's a place you go to shop. You're, you're not there to play games. You're there to buy whatever, the latest hotness. The other thing you're not going to find here is RPGs besides Dungeons and Dragons. And even then, for Dungeons and Dragons, all you're going to find is the official Watsy stuff. You're not going to find any third party stuff. Uh, great store if all you're trying to do is shop. Now, 401 Games. This is right downtown Toronto on Young Street. I know PS mentioned the one in Vaughan. I haven't seen the one in Vaughan. That's opened up more recently. I've only been to the downtown one. Um, the interesting part is they used to be at 401 Young. They're not. They've moved to a larger location, but they kept the old name. So I couldn't tell you the address. I used to know it, obviously. Um, amazing board game selection. Great. Decent RPG selection. Something always on sale. Like when you walk in, it'll be 30% off RPGs. Or it'll be 30% off sci-fi games or 30 percent off pirate games so always some kind of sale some of the best prices i've seen again due to volume the problem is the place is packed every time i have been in there the place is packed and you can't get anyone's attention the staff are so tied up being busy that it's even hard to check out because people are trying to look at the latest magic card or look at a game or get something down off a top shelf uh well they do have space to play i haven't used it i mainly go to their shop it's one of the things when we go on vacation we stop in and usually pick up a two-player game so the 401 games in vaughn is pretty massive uh okay. vaughn, vaughn has got uh much uh, lower prices than downtown young young street <laughs> um and it's got a huge area for tear it's a very big open uh like a warehouse style style store bright um okay. it's it's massive so yeah, the, the one downtown is not massive. It's, no, it's no. skinny, long <laughs> yeah. and skinny with lots of shelves and people bumping into you and getting in the way and trying to look at what you're trying to look at. Yeah, it's a little that, frustrating. That's just, a, that's just a, a cost thing. It's like trying to afford something in downtown New York, right? You gotta, right. You're going to get what you can yep. get at your price. Makes sense. So I have one more Toronto store. This is the Harry Tarantula. Um, I got to say, this one, I almost don't want to put on the list, but I have to for a specific reason. This, every pretty much negative stereotype I talked about above applies to this store. The thing is, this place has been around since the, I, I, I'd almost guess, 70s, possibly 80s. Maybe not the location, but like the owners have owned some of this stuff. Because this place has the most new old stock I've seen. Like stuff that has been on the shelves since the 1980s and 90s. Still has the original sticker price on it. Still has the shrink wrap. And has 20 years worth of dust sitting on it. If you are into classic games or just getting into like an older release game, like you're like, just, oh, wow. I just heard about West End Games D6 for the first time and I played it and it's so much better than the Fantasy Flight Star Wars and must have it all. This is the place you go to find that stuff that has literally been sitting there on the shelf for 20, 30 years. Like the last time I was there, I think I bought 12 D6 Star Wars Adventurers Journals for under five bucks. Like it was insane. Yep. Now, Harry Tarantula is, uh, is sort of an icon uh, and I yeah. believe they actually have they don't have two anymore. Because they they don't have two locations anymore? No. All that's left is Harry Tarantula North, which is down in the right. basement. Because uh, I'm, I'm looking at their event center, right, which they call their event center. Um, and their ca their schedule is packed. Like, their calendar, there is a ton of stuff to do at that store. I, the event center must be a separate location, because the store I was in does not have anywhere to play games. Because this is up at 3456 Young. It's, it's pretty far north. Uh, this was just past the 401, is where okay, the... Okay, no, that's... Uh, 
Yeah, so no, no, that's but, the one. So, but they've got they've got an event center of of that's packed with events. Okay, so um, maybe they have a separate game area. Maybe it's like LA Mood. There's another door next door that I didn't know about that possibly. leads to like a gaming area. But yeah, that is their only location. And yeah, it's, it's yeah, because I remember the old location. That yeah, the was, old one was downtown Young, close to 401 Games upstairs, yeah, 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 which yeah. also was rather eclectic and interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Now, I've only recently delved back into gaming. Uh, so I'm afraid Mar- Mo is far more up on his, on this than than I am, even in my own town. Um, I, I've been to you know Harry Tarantula and that, but it's been a, l- a large number of years uh, since uh, back when I used to live in Toronto. Uh, but right here in downtown Hamilton, we have Board Game Central, which is a great place. Now it's on the smaller side because they're actually in a mall, <laughs> but they still manage to have a place for gaming there. Uh, and every time I've been in the store, they've been polite, helpful, friendly staff. Uh, now, unfortunately, they only do gaming four nights a week, uh, and it's earlier on because, again, they're in a mall, so you're stuck mm-hmm. with uh, mall. Makes sense. Um, now, the other thing I found is recently, when I was out looking for a Keyforge, I found Black Knight Games up here on Hamilton Mountain. Now, I have to say, up front, I hate their website. Um, <laughs> and I uh, almost didn't go to the store because... It really kind of seemed more like a clubhouse sort of thing. Ooh. It was. It wasn't going to be a store. I was going to get this clubhouse of, of guys who gamed and and had a website. That does but happen. I have to say, I went to the store because I really wanted some KeyForge decks, and it was a fantastic store. Um, you walk in, the cash is right there, so there's an employee right there who can say hi to you and does say hi to you as soon as you walk in the door. They're ready to help you. They have a massive play area with lots of tables. Nice. Um, it's decorated. Again, it's Black Knight games, so not a big shock. But it's decorated in sort of you know cheesy medieval. Um, That's cool. Sort of, sort of something. style. Um, they, they've got little uh, you know wooden wooden uh, door frame house frames on the wall and things. They have a dedicated painting table, so four people can be sitting down and painting in a full on you know so all the supplies you need painting area. Nice. Uh, they have Blood Bowl areas. They have, you know, it's it's a really fantastic store. And I was, re- and once I got there, after being put off by the website, once I got into the store, I was really impressed. Uh, and if I had the time and, and didn't have the kids, I would probably be going there for game nights uh, uh, regularly. I think that's pretty awesome. Sounds good. So, what do you look for in a game store? Let us know in the comments or uh, in through social media. Now. If you'd like to read more gaming and game night topics like this, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice, where you'll see this and other topics answered in blog form. Uh, if you've got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. For those of you who are live in the lobby, our chat room, we ask to hear about your local game stores, and let's see what you had to say. We had uh, a lot of chat here about uh, bean saw, dip. <laughs> what's <laughs> that? Bean dip? <laughs> about bean dip. Uh, <laughs> I miss the bean dip. I see lots of talk about what's what's highest ranked games right now. Yeah. And a lot of people saying the Pathfinder is not in the top five. You know what? Pathfinder really plummeted because they announced a new edition right. that still hasn't come out. So I know that's a big part of it. Yeah, no. It's, uh, everyone's sort of going to hold off and, and find something else to do until they can uh, get the yeah. new... <laughs> Yeah, I know Shadzar agree with the the dirty, dingy, and smelly. That is definitely a thing. No, oh, absolutely. Uh, did note that's not always the physical location that has that problem. That that is that is a, a stereotype that is in uh, unfortunately true at times. Uh, Shadzar is pointing out that he wouldn't necessarily trust free food from some gaming stores, and depending uh, on the store, I I can agree. But yep. in general, they're trying not trying to poison their customers. That would no. not be good business. So. And now, a word from our sponsor. So back in November 2018, I contacted QuiverTime to see if they'd be interested in working together. I set up a deal with them where they'd send me a Quiver card-carrying case to review. And they were also willing to let me host a giveaway. Back then, I did up an unboxing video, actually one of our first, and I gave a rather positive review of their product. Well, we must have done something right, because QuiverTime has agreed to become the first official sponsor of the Tabletop Bellhop. Now, I do have to admit, I have a great time 
had a great time working with and interacting with John at Quiver Time in the past. Uh, we actually still communicate fairly regularly. We go back and forth on Twitter quite a bit. Uh, even before this deal, I got to admit, I was promoting their sales and promotions through tabletop gaming deals. They've come up in recent articles, and we've mentioned them many times on the show. Most recently, our How to Fly the Gamer Geek Flag article in the related podcast, episode 31. Now, the thing is, yes, they're our sponsor now, but I really do dig their product. I was going to be talking about them and giving them props anyway. The fact they're now a sponsor of the show is just an awesome and appreciated added bonus. So head over to quivertime.com slash bellhop and check out the Quiver, a kick-butt card-carrying case perfect for your card and card-based games. Now, we've got a special offer for our listeners and viewers. For the entire month of March, head over to Amazon.com, Amazon.ca, or the QuiverTime website at QuiverTime.com slash bellhop, and use the code DINGDING for 10% off the entire line of QuiverTime products. Though, actually, at Amazon.com, you got to use DING 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 three times, because the U.S. is special and needs another DING. So again, that's at QuiverTime.com or Amazon.ca, that's D-I-N-G-D-I-N-G, or at Amazon.com, that's D-I-N-G-D-I-N-G-D-I-N-G. We're growing through the support of fans like you. So if you haven't yet, please take a minute to subscribe, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share to your friends. Wherever and however you find us, you can help us grow. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I'm going to be sending out an email recapping all the content we've released the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, YouTube videos, anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage and you will find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. Now, if you are listening to our podcast right now, on the day it came out on Tuesday, that means Breakout is this coming weekend. I hope to see some of you there. So we are all looking forward to Breakout uh, and and some of the fantastic content and people who are going to be there, uh, from the board games to the RPGs to the panels they're having, and even, if we're lucky, the Keyforge Sealed Deck Tournament on Sunday. We've mentioned RPG a month a few times on the show. This is one of the challenges I signed up to take part in in 2019. Now, this was something started by Roger Braslett, and I've kind of taken the torch from him and have been running with it for the last two years. Now, the goal of this challenge is to get some use out of those role-playing games, modules, flat books that you've picked up, but never actually sat down and read. Whether that means booting up the PDF reader or dusting off a book from your shelf of shame, it doesn't matter. It's hard to imagine too many gamers who don't have something sitting around. I haven't really done any RPG in years, and I have at least half a dozen games on Red, and I still pick up a free one now and then, <laughs> even knowing that I rarely read them. Yeah, there's something, the collector aspect, you can't help it. And you always buy them with you, oh, that looks awesome, I'm going to read that. So the book I read for RPG a month in February was Shadow of the Demon Lord by Robert J. Schwalb. This is the first new book from his company, Schwalb Enterprises. Now, people may recognize the name Robert Schwab, or Bob Schwab, from games you may have heard of, like Dungeons and Dragons, like whether that's 3.5, fourth edition, or the, you know, the one that everyone's talking about now, fifth edition. Yeah, he was one of the lead developers. Or this other game, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. I don't know anyone who played that. Uh, Dragon Magazine. I read a couple of those. Um, Numenera. I, I played a board game about that. But yeah, rather big, big titles in the RPG industry. Big name. Now, I wrote up a rather long, rather is probably still cutting it short, very detailed chapter-by-chapter -chapter review of this beautiful hardcover book over on the blog. Now, if you're curious about this game at all, like feel free to keep listening, but just if, get the full details, head over to the blog, click on reviews, and check it out. And that's at tabletopbellhop.com. Click on reviews. You may need to scroll down a bit, but it's hard to miss. Fun fact, some uh, big uh, RPG forums were suggesting people read that article to see yep. if they were going to be interested in buying the game. So, obviously, uh, some other folks think that it's a pretty good review. Yeah, this one's gotten a lot of traction, actually. I've gotten a lot of feedback on it. And actually, when I started asking around what I should read for March, I had a bunch of people jump up and they're like, more Demon Lord, more Demon Lord. I'm like, all right, cool. <laughs> So what I'm going to say here, this is the this is the condensed version. Trust me, it's not going to be as long as the blog post. Is that I am very 
impressed. Like, really. I, like, I went in expecting to like this game. Like, everyone I know on Twitter when it came out, now this has been out for a while, it came out in 2015, said this is the spiritual successor to Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, first and second edition. Now, at that time, there was no Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, fourth edition, and there was no Zweehander. At the time, there was Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, third edition, which was not very popular. Personally, I loved it. But it wasn't very popular, so a lot of people were saying, well, Schwab has done what should have been. The, the next Warhammer game. And I, I've talked about it on the show. I love Warhammer. I grew up playing Warhammer. Sean grew up playing Warhammer with me. Uh, so what I didn't expect reading Shadows of the Demon Lord was that my expectations, which were high, would be exceeded. Now, here are just some highlights from the book. Now, this is very much a traditional D20, F20, fantasy-based RPG. While it's not D&D or Pathfinder, it has a lot in common. You're rolling D20 to do things. Uh, damage, you're going to roll separate with different dice. Now, in this game, it's only D6s. Instead of your usual strength, dex, con, whatever, you only have four stats instead of six. One thing I really like is stat bonuses are very simple. So instead of having to look up on a chart what a 13 means, you just subtract your stat by 10. Really simple. If you have an 8, you're at minus 2. If you have a 13, you're at plus 3. Now, starting stats are determined by ancestry. Uh, this book includes some rather interesting ancestry that sets the setting apart from other games. You've got humans and dwarves. You expect to see those, but you don't usually find games with changelings, goblins, orcs, and clockwork as their ancestry you can pick, or race in this game. Clockwork are literally clockwork beings that have a key and have to be wound up and it's as a character when you create your character you have to decide where your key is and if you're not wound you stop it's tough to do ancestry well without leaning on some of the unfortunately racist history mm -hmm. uh, it's nice to see when games really make that effort to do it well yeah even just eliminating the term race from the game is a nice touch that's uh, that's good to see in modern role playing now, one of the new mechanics I really dig is a system of banes and boons. Now, this replaces most of the in-game modifiers, the same way advantage and disadvantage works in 5th ed D&D, except mechanically it's very different. If something positive would affect what you're about to do, you get boons. If something negative, you get banes, and you add them up. I have three boons and two banes, and they cancel out, so I have one boon overall, for example. Uh, what you do is you're going to roll a d6 for each one of these you have, and you're going to take the highest result for all of them. So say you had three boons, you're going to roll 3d6, you're going to pick the highest d6, and boons are positive, so you add it to your d20 roll, whereas banes, you subtract. Now, another thing I liked is the way they replace the entire idea of skills and skill trees. What you do now is when you start your character, you're going to have two professions, and then as you level up, you can get more, and you, you could be, say, a farmer, and these are professions like really basic medieval fantasy-style mundane things like fisher, farmer, laborer, uh, rat catcher, right, to tie back to Warhammer. What happens in the game is this very storytelling driven is you know all the skills a farmer would know. So when something comes up in the game and a farmer-based thing applies, you get to add boons to your roles. The last mechanical thing I do want to talk about is something they call paths. This is how characters advance in level. You start off as a peasant, zero level with two uh, professions. That's it. When you hit level one, you choose your path. Now, paths at this level are very D&D inspired, obviously. There are four choices. Warrior, magician, priest, or rogue. But then when you hit third level, you get an extra path. This now branches into 16 options. Then later you get a master path that branches into a crazy 64 different choices. I don't know the permutations and combinations on that, but the amount of different character progression paths, that's got to be a big number. Now, another thing tied to this that's really interesting is that you level up after every adventure, and they expect the standard adventure to be one game session, and there's only a level 11 levels. So you tend to get through an entire campaign in as few as 11 sessions. Now, this brings back so many delightful memories of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 1st Edition, hearing about the, the path system and, the, mm -hmm. and starting off as that basic nobody, you know, that, that yes. you're a farmer, you're a rat catcher, you're a pickpocket, uh, mm -hmm. you, you, you aren't the sword-swinging barbarian, you're just a dude who's going to start adventuring now. Um, yeah. 
I love it. Like, like spiritual successor to Warhammer fits so well. It really does. And that ties into what I want to finish off with, which is just a little bit of talk about the setting. So this is interesting because it's not D&D. It is not high fantasy glowing heroes saving the world. This is a post-apocalyptic grim, dark horror fantasy setting. It's like taking Warhammer and jumping to the end of the implied storyline where the demons are invading. The end times are here. Chaos is here. This is where the name comes in. The demon lord is the, is the biggest bat ever, right? He's stuck in the abyss, and all he wants to do is get out of the abyss and tear the world apart, actually the universe apart. Now, due to events that have already happened in the setting, there are rifts torn in reality to the abyss, and the shadow of the demon lord is now stretching through those rifts and touching parts of the people and the land. Now, the long-standing empire, the big, good, gallant, we royal everything, we're great, that's fallen. It's in utter chaos. The powers behind the throne are no longer hiding. Demons are coming out into the world. The world is ending. And what are you going to do about it? Now, Ancient Games asks, uh, is that you have the same skills a farmer would have, uh, the same as uh, DCC sort of thing? Uh... Yes, actually, DCC has a, has a very similar system to that. That is that is almost the exact same type of thing, and I'm not sure which game came out first. I don't know if one in, inspired the other, but yeah, it's it's got a very similar system. So instead of having I am trained in whatever uh, the wet nursing, and I I can climb walls and I can pickpocket, you know, I uh, instead I have two professions. Uh, I finally broke Sean. Yeah. I think that's the first time on the show. So now, one wet thing wet nursing I... three. <laughs> so now, one thing I noticed that you point out in uh, some of your Twitter comments about the uh, is that there's no sample game. Um, now why yeah. is that? Why is that something that you like to see in a game? I, you know what? For me, the the sample adventure, right? The what to do with the book. I learned this from Warhammer First Edition, right? The Olden Hauler contract. I read Warhammer, and I get Warhammer. I'm reading it, and I get it mechanically. But I didn't really grok what Warhammer was supposed to be until running and reading that adventure. Seeing the whole cultist in behind the city running things and the fact the guy had underground caves with a chaos demon down there. Like that really highlights what to expect from a Warhammer game. So to me, the, the module in the back of the book, the, the sample adventure, the sample setting, to me is... The designer telling me how to run their game. So I have this big book of rules. Here's how to do it. Here's how to run everything. Well, what do I do with that? I love having a chapter there that goes, hey, this is what you do with everything I just gave you. This is what you do with the rules. This is what I expect you to do with it. Because in general, most games are going to run better if run to the way the designer intended it to be played. And that gives you an indicator of that. So this even jumps back to my Shadowrun review, that one of my biggest complaints about that Shadowrun box was that there was a sample adventure that didn't have a Shadowrun in it. Like, the implied setting of Shadowrun is you do Shadowruns, then why is the sample adventure a shoot-up in a convenience store? Like, I didn't get that. And Shadows of the Demon Lord, disappointingly, has none of that. There is no adventure. There's a sample setting. There's a whole fluff setting that sets out this whole empire, and here's all these people, and here's the important king and queen. It even focuses in on one part they obviously expect you to play in, but doesn't give you a plot. doesn't tell you what to do with it. Right. Okay. So, uh, you have another review for us, I believe. Yes, I do. We've got two. So yeah, it's a two-for-one special this week. I've got not one, but two reviews. Not only did I write far too much about Shadows of the Demon Lord. Again, Shadows. Shadow of the Demon Lord. He only has one. You know, you think a Demon Lord, maybe you could have multiples. I, not only did I write far too much about Shadow of the Demon Lord, I also felt the need to write about my play experience with Jim Henson's Labyrinth, the board game from River Horse Limited. Now, this board game came out in 2016, and when it did, I knew I had to buy a copy for Deanna. She is a huge Labyrinth fan, one of the biggest I know, and I know a lot of Labyrinth fans. So I, I wouldn't say rushed out, but I ordered it online, and I got a copy, and I hid it in one of my drawers upstairs and gave it to her for Christmas in 2017. Yeah, that's right, 2017. It's been over a year since I bought this, and it took us until last Monday to get it played. 
Now, I find this kind of shocking, and nothing to do with when you when you got it or how long it took you to get mm. played, and not that there's even such a, a game for such an amazing movie, but that it waited until 2016 before there was a game for this amazing yeah. movie. Yeah, well, I think it just had to do with board games got popular enough, and there's enough buzz nowadays that the license owners were like, ooh, we got to get in on this board game thing. That's the only thing I can think of. I don't know what it is, because at the same time, they also released the uh, Dark Crystal game, same company. So well, I don't Dark know Crystal who River least, Horse is. Dark Crystal at least came uh, came back, and it's back in, it came back into the news, and there was a whole yeah. sort of uh, refresh about that. But, I mean, 1986 was, was when Labyrinth came out. Wow. <laughs> um, so to, than I remember. to wait 20 years before you, uh, yeah, uh, I don't years. know. Yeah. I don't know why it took so long. Now, as for why it took me so long to get to it, well, that's because I put it upstairs and waited till Christmas. And then that time between Christmas or when I bought it in Christmas, man, the reviews started to come out and ooh, they, they were not good. Um, I gotta admit, they they were bad enough that people started to hear about it, including people in my gaming group, and it became really hard to convince people to finally play this game. And what's really bad is I am here to tell you that those reviews were so right, but it's so pretty. I most of it until it ends up in two parts. That should be one part. <laughs> it does look pretty good. Now I gotta admit, like by the time I read the rules, I knew it was gonna be bad. But it didn't seem that bad. Like, it's a roller move. But every character has different speed stats that corresponds to a different die, so that's kind of cool. Yes, it's a roller move, but you flip a card from a deck, like a huge deck, and you're going to encounter someone from the movie. That sounds kind of neat. Kind of reminds me of the adventure deck in Talisman, and i got to admit, I do have some small bit of love for Talisman. Uh, you have to make checks, and they're based on stats, so they're speed, will, or brawn, and each character has different dice to assume signed to them. So you got a nice RPG element there. You can even spend willpower points to add a D20 to your roll and keep the highest roll out of that in your stat. I'm like, that's cool. There's even a really, actually, I would still say good mechanic for teaming up, where if two characters meet in the labyrinth, they can travel together. When they do that, they all get to roll all their dice and you take the highest one. Now, if you fail, everyone gets hurt, which everyone takes a bad thing. Like, I gotta admit, like, even saying it now, that sounds pretty good. Maybe not like the best game ever, but pretty good. But it's it's not. Well, perhaps there was a reason it didn't come out sooner. Yeah, it feels like it came out sooner. I think that's part of the problem. Like, the biggest problem is those Labyrinth cards. They're boring. Like, really, really boring. 90% of them just say, make a test, D6. If you fail, lose willpower. If you pass... Wait, there is no if you pass. If if you pass, you just pass. There, there's no reward for passing in this game. You just don't lose willpower. And then that card that you just either lost willpower on or not either goes on the board so everyone can hit it again or it goes to the bottom of the deck so you can see it again. Rinse and repeat. Do this over and over and over every turn until you find the magic card that lets you go to the Goblin City where you do more tests. Except now they're all brawn tests because you got to get past Humongous, then you got to get past the Goblin Guards, then you got to get past some Mounted Guards, then you got to get past the Goblin Artillery, which sounds almost epic. Except it's make a brawn test, make a brawn test, make a brawn test, make a brawn test. Then you finally get to meet the Goblin King, David Bowie himself, and make a will test. Except he's got a D twenty, so good luck. I won't make a codpiece joke. I won't make a codpiece joke. I won't make a codpiece joke. <laughs> we will rub the area. Uh, what I find most disappointing, though, is the fact that it could have been so much better. Like, just by tweaking those cards, like, just put out a new set of Labyrinth cards and make them actually interesting, you'd have a decent enough game. Like, make it so that you, like, encounter people and find items and maybe get, like, witch boy choices or something. It could have been good. But no, this game's garbage. There are literally only two good things in this box. One, I gotta say, is the player pieces. Uh, the player that you've got the main characters in Jareth, and they are sweet miniatures. Uh, to be honest, it's potentially enough reason to buy this game on its own, is just to get the minis. The other thing that's good in this box is you get a nice set of RPG dice ranging from D4 to D20. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I was just uh, adding a quote to Nightbot there. Uh, now, this game is selling because of those figures. 
I don't have a doubt about that. Yeah. Because <laughs> they're pretty. Um, sure. The problem is they have made an action-based game on a character-based movie. Mm-hmm. If you distill the movie down, as much as I love it, and I am a huge fan, maybe not D-level fan, but I'm a huge fan, the story itself is very simplistic. The characters, the puppetry, and the acting are what make it special. If you take away all that, which the game does, mm-hmm. you've got a really boring step-along-the-road game. Yeah. And and so they, they really kind of distilled something that, and they distilled away all the parts of it that were interesting. Now, I do have to admit, I, I've given this a ton of beef, and I think it deserves it, but it's still better than, say, Snakes and Ladders, whereas we were talking about, like, when you take Battleship Monopoly or whatever, or Battleship Monopoly, that came out weird. Hmm. I wonder if that exists. I was thinking Star Wars Battleship and how they didn't do anything right. to make it Star Wars. At least they tried to do stuff David Bowie-ish. Like, you do fight the goblin. Like, okay, it's a step above, but, like, that, not in today's days of hobby board games, there's no excuse to put out a game this dated. I think well, it's probably the especially, best especially when they're 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 pulling a sort of bait and switch because again yes. the miniatures are so gorgeous you can't oh, not so want nice. to buy it except with those miniatures comes basically another crap game I mean it's like it's a yeah. five or something on BGG it's just it's barely a game yep um, yeah I got it it just believe uh, believe the hype I, I realize I'm just yet another voice in the choir here telling you this game's garbage but for those of you who trust my opinion over the rest of the internet for some reason <laughs> I'm just reaffirming what everyone else said this one really is bad every now and then people say games are bad and they're actually good now nah, this this one can go away there we go so uh, Chadzar says we send the labyrinth game designers to the bog of eternal stench or into the oubliette Guess what you do in your oubliette? You miss a turn. There's another dated mechanic that should be removed from all games. Yeah, yeah. Bog of Eternal Stench, actually, I can admit that's an almost amusing. You get a stink token, and then other players don't want to adventure with you, and you can't team up anymore because you stink. So, again, they tried to tie it in. They, they tried, but it just, no. So, now, Mo only really scratched the surface here. If you want to hear more about this rather bad game, like <laughs> how the board self-destructed upon opening, head over to the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. So we've got something totally different for last Friday's Gloomhaven game, because it wasn't a Gloomhaven game at all. Nope, not at all. No Kator, no random dungeon, no prosperity, getting way too quick by using the extreme rules, and worst of all, another night with me on screen. <laughs> I don't know, we didn't receive any complaints that I know of. Nope. Uh, for more about that, though, watch, watch the video about the extreme rules. Check out the video. You can find out about that. Uh, this packed week, we had not one, not two, but three players unable to game. That left me, and that's it. So my initial thought was to, to do another random dungeon, right? Let's check out the solo rules, show people how that's played. I, I don't know them myself. The problem is I hadn't read the solo rules before Friday, so I got downstairs like way too close to when we were supposed to start the stream, and I opened it up, and I found out you have to play two characters. Well, that's a problem, because that means for our party, I'm going to have to control one of the other player's characters along with mine. And that doesn't seem like something I want to do, and I'm not sure any of the other players would have been cool with that. Hey, Tori, I leveled up your guy while you were gone. I don't think he would have liked that. Plus, if anyone doesn't need more XP, that's me, my character. Like, I'm way ahead of everyone else. I really don't need more XP. So the other option, and i got to admit, I considered this, was to open up the two characters we hadn't opened yet. Like, out of the original six, we've opened four out of six. Uh, These are starting characters, so I wouldn't be spoiling anything. The problem is that these are new. Like, they're they're not even punched. Like, I think there was something you had to punch. That goes back a lot of games. And, like, I would have had to make up a new character sheet, and I just, I didn't have time before the show to give them a once-over. I think I'd like to at least read them over before jumping into the jumping into the the game right away with all brand new stuff, right? I didn't feel comfortable streaming that. I would have been a bad representation of Gloomhaven, I think, and probably of myself. Um, So I didn't want to do that either. Plus, what do I do with them, right? Even if I did, like, open up the boxes live on the stream and everyone got to see me react to 
whatever the other two characters are. What am I going to do? Toss them in our campaign? Like, I start a new group? What adventure do I do? Like, do I try to find one that's definitely a slide plot? Like, I think it would have been lame if I jumped in and continued the main plot. Hey, guys, remember we were supposed to go see that enchanter? Well, I did that the week you guys weren't here. Here's what he said. No, I don't think that would have been cool. So basically, it's, it's all the same problems we had the first time we had a player missing and what we were trying to do short one player. We were short on time and in need of content, so we were looking for options. Yeah, so I'm thinking now what I could probably do next time, if I know this is coming, is open up the two new characters ahead of time and play them in casual mode. Now, I could replay a scenario we've already beaten, which could be interesting, or just do a random dungeon. With some prep time, that's probably what I'll do next time when I find out it's just me who's free on a Friday night. Now... I said I didn't do that this time, so what did we do? Well, what else do you do with your friends on a Friday night? Read an FAQ. <laughs> yes, that's right. We basically went through the rather huge, I think it might even be longer than my uh, shadow review, the rather huge, unofficial, but Isaac-endorsed FAQ on Board Game Geek. We literally started at the top and discussed many of the questions in detail while skimming over some of the more obvious stuff that's already in the rulebook pretty blatantly now we didn't spoil anything we talked about it before the show and thought we might but no we didn't because one of the good things about this faq on board game geek is that all the spoilers are hidden you have to click on them so we just went through the basic questions and i gotta say it took us about two hours to get through all of them you would think that a game that's currently in its third printing with a fourth on its way that they would have gotten things sorted out by now yeah you would like you really would they're they're on a fourth printing by now there are a lot of problems in that that book in in the rules and on the cards and with certain items and with certain character boxes and so on i got to admit there was plenty of stuff in that list i know we messed up now quite a bit of it is stuff we got wrong early and Sist adjusted. And I got to thank uh, Fenton Crackshell for correcting us on some of those issues. There was stuff we messed up, though, as recently as our last game. Like, one I didn't know, the fact you can't visit Gloomhaven after a random dungeon, so you can't get blessed or have city encounters, which means our prestige is inflated, uh, wow, by at least eight times that we've gotten blessings after non-campaign games. Oof. Uh, another one, too, is they nerf stamina potions. Anyone listening who plays Gloomhaven, you might want to look this up. Stamina potions only give one card back now. I guess they decided they were overpowered. Ouch. Um, but there was more, like plenty more. Uh, way too many to talk about now or here. Like, you're going to have to check out the video when it goes live. For those watching or hearing this on the podcast, you can find that video on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash tabletopbellhop, and it'll be in our Gloomhaven playlist if you are interested in uh, sitting for a spell and watching uh, a lot of content. Remember that you can watch the Bellhop, Deanna, and Kator, pending any wedding plans, cons, or illness, every week at 8.30 p.m. Eastern, every Friday night at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. And now, later than usual, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tabletops? Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we've played, any events we've attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog <laughs> version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com under On the Table. Uh, this was not a busy week for me, not gaming-wise. Like, there, there was gaming happening, but it wasn't one of those, oh, I fit in this, 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 and this. So this is going to be a little shorter than usual for me. Uh, plus, I already talked about Jim Henson's Labyrinth back in the review section. So that leaves me with Dinosaur Island Totally Liquid Extreme Edition and another big game of Zaya. While I played a lot of the DC Deck Builder, that's about all I played. I'm not even sure I've actually finished any games on Board Game Arena. There was a three-way tie... Uh, Seven Wonders, but I don't know if you were in that one. That's the one I know that I finished off. Okay. Now, remember how I complained about Dinosaur Island? Way too short. Way, way too short. Uh, and even that we've tried the medium length objectives and it was better, but still only about five turns. What well, seems I wasn't the only one. Uh, I have to assume it was people online complaining or possibly Plandosaurus realized it themselves because the first section of the rulebook for Totally Liquid, this is the expansion for Dinosaur Island, is all about how to fix the game length. Right up, first thing in the book, first chapter you read, paragraph. 
There, these, and it notes that these are rules that should be adopted to all plays, whether you're using anything in the expansion or not. Uh, it's a really simple fix. All they've done is made it so that you start with more objectives. So with two players, you now have five objectives instead of three. And for all player counts, the game ends when there's one objective incomplete. Well, it's always sad when, when a game comes out and it's got a flaw like this game length. But I appreciate that they owned up to it and corrected it, even if it did require a separate game purchase. Uh, to be honest, it's probably on a really long board game geek FAQ, kind of like that stamina potion fix, and I just didn't actually go and look for that one. Fair enough. Uh, the rest of Totally Wicked, though, is a series of modules. It's one of those box sets where you can add a bunch of different things in, if you want, in any combination to the base game. Now, we tried all but one of them out all at once. We tossed everything into the pot, and I gotta say, for doing that, it went rather well. Uh, none of these modules are overly complicated or add so much to the game that became overwhelming. But we did find some of the modules to be better than others. Now, the one module we did not use is the fifth player module. We only had four players. Pretty simple. Uh, I gotta admit, fifth player does have a bit more than just, hey, here's more components. Um, there's a new market expands and there's a few other rule tweaks with the dice. Uh, we didn't try that out, though. What first module we did use, though, which is where the name of the box comes from, Totally Liquid, are Aquatic Dinosaurs. This is an odd addition, so it adds a fourth dinosaur type to the lab phase. Now, what's odd, though, is that these dinos are very random. In the base game, all the dinos are the same, in a way. They just take different DNA, so every herbivore mechanically is the same of every other as every other herbivore. They just take different DNA to research. Well, these water dinos are all over the place. Like, there are some that are really hard to research. Uh, there are some that give a ton of threat but are really easy to make. There are some that give no threat but are really hard to make. Like, on one hand, I like that not all the dinosaurs are the same. It's cool to see this random element. But on the other hand, there were some of these high-threat dinos that just seemed like no one would ever take them. There was no reason to use them. Now, anyone who saw the images you shared of this game also saw that it's a good thing you played this at home on the big <laughs> table. The sprawl is a real problem. Yes, yes. This, it was already a table hawk. It got bigger. Uh, the, the market board's bigger. You now need these sideboards, which are park extensions, which is the next thing I want to talk about. Uh, there's now more bits. There's now blue dinosaurs for all the water ones. It used, I, I have nine bowls. I think we used about eight of them. Like, yeah, it's, it's, it is a table hog. Um, those park extensions I mentioned, that is part of a two part. Um, module where you have park extensions and CEOs or bosses. Uh, what that does is add a new draft to the start of the game. So each player is going to pick a park extension and a CEO. What these do is they add an asymmetric element to the game. And I have mixed thoughts on this too, despite being a big fan of asymmetric elements normally. Besides the CEO tokens being dumb, like, sorry, they're dumb. They don't match the cards. I don't know. It's it's one thing. It's, it's kind of like the same thing where the dinos don't actually match any of the pitch of the dinos. I don't know why. But skipping the fact that tokens are silly, all these new things were complicated. Like, one player gets this whole board where they now have to track eggs, and they have their own little egg counters. Another person was raising goats and had to keep track of goat counters and what was happening with their goats. Um, Deanna had a giant T-Rex pen and could add extra receipts for people to watch the TV. Like, it was just more stuff that each player had to focus on that didn't affect the other players at all. And it just seemed to take away the focus from the main game and the main board. Uh, both the CEOs were the same thing. It's just they, they had special abilities that made everyone different, but it was like, wait, what's your CEO do again? Again, it just, it drew focus away what I felt was the, the core game. Now, a module I did like is the Blueprints module. Now, this one, at the start of the game, you each get two cards, they're Blueprint cards, and you pick one, and what it is is just a way to lay out your park. It shows a plan. And the closer you fit to it, the more points you get at the end of the game. Really simple, really cool addition. I liked it. Another one I liked is called the PR module. This is similar because it gives players direction, so you get two hidden scoring goals. Now, unlike the blueprints, you get to keep both of these cards, which is cool because you can change your strategy mid-game. You can be working towards one thing, be like, wow, this isn't working, I'm going to work towards the other card. I dig that, too. So, again, more asymmetry, uh, and definitely something we know the Gut Bellhop's uh, gameplay tends to uh, prefer... Yeah. Even if this uh, this particular method wasn't ideal. 
Yeah, I love the the asymmetry added by the PR cards, and I like the asymmetry added by the blueprint cards. I just wasn't a huge fan of the park extensions. It was just distracting, I think is the best way to say it. Now, those are the modules. Now, in addition to the modules, there is some other stuff in the box. You get some new DNA dice. These are cool because they've got some new symbols on them. Uh, one lets you upgrade your security. The other one's to get money. Um, there's a whole bunch of new cards, like a ton. There, there's basically all the different types of cards. New objectives, new specialists, new plot twists. Um, there's also a new lab upgrade, so that's all cool to see. Uh, overall, i got to say I liked the longer gameplay created. More objectives, definitely. Pandasaurus is right. I'm going to always play that way. We're going to use those every time. Great fix for the short game problem. All the additional kites and cards are awesome. Throw them in. As for the modules, eh, some I like, some I don't. Now, is there are some of these modules you like and some you can pass on. Is it just that they've added a variety of, of additions for different types of players and maybe don't even expect you to use them all? Just pick the ones that work best for you and your group? I, I'm pretty sure that's probably the intention. Uh, one of the things that is included in the game I didn't mention is a deck to shuffle to determine which you're going to use. Oh, okay. So I think that's a way to do it, too. Instead of using all of them, it's like, hey, just to add variety to the game, like this time we're going to use this one. Or maybe next time we're going to draw two cards out of it. I'll admit the rules didn't really have a description on how to use these. I can see it, though. Like I, I didn't query everyone sitting at the table for what they liked, but I do know Mike seemed to dig his CEO power a lot, so I think he liked that aspect of the game. Um, I forget. what was Sean was raising baby dinosaurs, and I think he got a kick out of that, so I think they seemed to enjoy the park extensions more than I did. But it makes sense, right? If you're going to put out a bunch of different modules, obviously different players are going to like different things. Uh, I think it's a legit point and probably intentional on their point to try to hit different groups who like different things. Like If you don't like asymmetry, pull that stuff out. Never use it. So for you, let me guess, deck building and more deck building with some card games on the side? Absolutely. So it was very much a DC week uh, and trying out some more of their expansions. Now we started over with Crossover Pack 2, which is Arrow based off the TV show Arrow. Okay. Uh, now, while similar to the basic game, it's still, you know, uh, you know you're fighting your villains and somebody wins at the end with the most victory points. Uh, they've uh, gone and focused on an almost ignored game mechanic. Mm. Uh, in the basic game, there's a couple of uh, cards that will have you slide a card underneath your hero card to basically just get it out of the way. But you can always seem to get them back. Usually it's a villain makes you hide a card that, that's out of, out of play for a while, but when you beat the villain, you get your card back. But Arrow has doubled down on this. So you're actually storing things out of the game under your hero, uh, and they phrase it as secrets. They're, they're, the concept is, because of the way the Arrow TV show is, for anyone who happens to look for it, everyone has secrets, and it's a very, very okay. you know, secretive sort of uh, theme. And so what they're doing is cards that are hidden under your hero are the secrets that are being kept. Um, and they've added cards which allow cards to be both taken out of play and put under your hero, uh, taken from an taken from under another hero, or taken out from under your own hero. Um, but normally, for the most part, they're out of the game and they aren't victory okay. point counts. Um, now, it allows for some interesting strategies because of the this new interaction. Uh, and unfortunately, I saw the advantages sooner than my kids. <laughs> Uh, and I managed to actually bury more cards under there, which my kids didn't figure out why I was doing until the end, when I actually managed to score them all as victory points. Okay. Um, so it's, uh, you know, if you, you've got to be careful and you've got to be aware of all these new mechanics. They, they just didn't quite catch on to, to, to what I was, was doing and, and got burned because of it. But uh, if, you are, uh, if you are there, it's a nice little twist to the game and a nice uh, new mechanic. I know you said kids, so your daughter's still into it too, which is cool. Absolutely, yep. She's still all in. That's awesome. So back at my place, Saturday night, I had another group of Game Overs to play some more Zaya. Now, this is not the same group as last week, uh, though there was one player who played in both games. Uh, actually, it was another local gamer, Chad, who heard us talking about our previous play and was like, oh man, you own Zaya, I need to try that game. So that drove me getting a group together on Saturday. Now this was a four player game using everything I own. So the base game, the Sellsword Mark II as an NPC, uh, Embers of Forsaken Star, and Missions and Powers. Uh, we played a 15 fame point game. And I gotta say again, it was, it was an epic game. I went about four and a half hours, but that did include having to explain the rules 
I, uh, to do two new players, and Zaya is not a quick teach. There are a lot of things to explain in that game. I'm still loving it. Uh, it is such a great sandbox game. And that was the thing that Chad just couldn't believe. He just kept noting it while he was playing. He's like, no, and man, in this game, you really can do whatever you want. And then we'd be in, he's like, wow, like you can do that. You can do whatever you want. I can do what I want. And he just kept repeating it. And that is what I love about that game, is that like there are so many valid strategies. The fact that they give you a card that says how to win with a big list of ways to get fame points I think is a great indicator. And actually teaching tip for this game, as I've now found the better way to teach the game is start with that card, start at the top, and explain how to get victory points all the way through. That went a little better than my last teach. Now in this last game, I focused on exploration and most of my fame came from grabbing those exploration tokens and exploring as many sector tiles as possible because I was trying to discover new things. Now another player was... Uh, Justin was making money selling stuff on Loth. Uh, this is the pirate world. Uh, and he was grabbing stuff from all over the board and just selling it right to Loth, at least until the market crashed and there were no more goods to be bought on any planets. Now, my friend Chris was trying to do the merchant marauder thing, right? Which was going great, but man, he got screwed when the market crashed. And I got to admit, Chris kind of has a strategy in his head and keeps trying to go for it. He never recovered. He didn't adapt to the new game environment. Now, seeing as Chad was the one asking about this, I want to specifically talk about his experience because, man, he was all all over the place. He was trying out different things. Uh, he ended up getting the majority of his points, though, by digging up relics on Lost Worlds. Overall, though, this play just reinforced my opinion of the base game being fantastic, but the Embers of Forsaken Star, I gotta say, is must-have. Like, they almost should ship them together at this point. Just, like, put both prices together. Don't sell the base game without it. Because there is no way that exploration strategy I was doing would have worked with the base rules. That's one of the things they tweaked. They completely replaced all the exploration tokens in the expansion. That market crash that completely changed up everyone's strategy part through the game, that comes from an event, and events come from Embers. Uh, having the kiln was big. The kiln is the space station that circles, orbits the central star. It was huge because when we started off, there were no planets in our area. So we had a place we could go back to restore because, man, our ships all took a massive amount of ice damage early in the game. Now, both the kiln and ice damage, again, come from embers. So that's all stuff we wouldn't have experienced at all without it. Now, the only complaint Chad had, and I got to admit, this is one I share with him, is the fact that I just convinced him to spend money on a copy of a game, and it's not cheap. And man, I've been there. I've felt that before. I got to admit, he's responsible for making me want to spend money on Great Western Trail. So I owed you, Chad. Well, this game has just blown up uh, since Embers came out on the open market. Uh, I was actually, I was checking, and I was surprised to see that it hasn't shown up on hotness on BGG no. because uh, the buzz about it is just real. Yeah, it's a lot of people talking about it. once it went once far off games got that second printing. I don't know if it hit retail like local game stores, but it definitely hit the online stores. Yeah, and they're yeah definitely it, selling it, it, it on went live. On, it went live on Amazon, and that was yeah. sort of the trigger that just yeah, just boom. So besides Arrow, did you get any other snow day gaming in? Because we've I had did. a lot of snow days. <laughs> I, yeah, I did. Now, for our snow day, we broke out the Rogues expansion, uh, which is a crossover pack, uh, number five. And this is, again, more cards to uh, with a similar play to the base game, but you flip roles. So oh. in this, you're playing uh, villains, uh, but very minor villains. They're, they're kind of the, the nobodies of the things. Um, mostly, they're, they're the Flash villains. So they're, they're, they're the, you know, Mr. Freeze and Killer Frost and, and lower grade villains on the, the giant scale of <laughs> DC of the DC uh, universe. Um, and then again, your foes are actually superheroes. Okay. Now, we really enjoyed this, but we need to play again, unfortunately, as once we real once we finished, we realized that we'd actually used villains from a different set. Huh. So, so you had villains versus villains? So no, it was it was still villains versus heroes, but it wasn't the villains from the rogue deck that we thought we were oh. playing with. <laughs> um, so now, this is actually one of the really interesting things about the game, because we didn't play, this wasn't an extreme game. This was all completely within the rules. It was just a different experience using these villains than the villains that had actually come in that box set. <laughs> okay. um, so it, I'm going to be interested to see if it, uh, if it gets harder 
uh, with the correct villains because I, I suspect it will because again they are supposed to be these low end low grade villains uh, and we used some some beefier villains it turns out uh, this is also the first time that we actually used any of the expansions that require uh, victory point tokens in game um, and this is because the rogues being such low powered nobodies their cards the cards that are added into the main deck from them aren't really worth anything in the end of the game but dear when you use them you get victory point tokens that you can trade and, and use throughout the during the gameplay um, and if you manage to save up enough of them become an end game uh, uh, value uh, so it's really it's really nice the little twists and turns they're adding with each expansion a little mechanic here a little twist there um, and how you can just pick and choose what you'd like to use by which cards you uh, throw into the deck at the beginning of the game. It's good to hear that the the mishmash works. That the the whole point of the what do they call it the Cerberus engine? I think yep. is what they yep. call it. Yeah, the the whole point of the Cerberus engine was that you'd be able to buy these separate games and buy the setting you like or the characters you like or the heroes or villains you like and be able to mash them all together. It's cool to hear how it works. So it's still I find it fascinating that each of these is adding something different. Yeah, the like fact that there are change. there are these this this wealth of mechanics that they're willing to throw into the game and just hey you're gonna buy something new fine not only are you gonna get new cards you're gonna get a new mechanic you're gonna get yeah, a new way to play that's cool and um, it, it kind of goes back to what you're asking about Dinosaur Island I wonder if it's again for different groups of players if different people are going to like some of those mechanics more than others possibly it's interesting they just announced the new uh, the new expansion that's coming out this year and it's actually adding movement. For the first time, there are meeples involved in the oh, game God. now. I don't know uh, about that. That's... So, so we'll we'll see. I don't think the release date has been nailed down yet, but uh, meeples and movement will be the this year's expansion uh, to DC. Was it meeple meeple realty? One of the companies out there does superhero meeple. They're really cute. I've seen them many times, but I'm like, I don't actually need any of those. Yeah, I forget. I'd have to check my my recycling because in every expansion pack you get a. Uh, here you can buy some meeples from super yeah. your superheroes. It's probably it's probably the same company I'm thinking of. I'm just yeah. forgetting who it is. Meeple Realty? No, that's that's a no. I, I company. Yeah, I, anyway. I, I throw out the card every time I get it. It's yeah. just, <laughs> there you go. Um, uh, so finally, though, I wanted to say I was happy to see my son teaching DC awesome. uh, to his friends this weekend. He's really taken to the game. Uh, again, he still needs a little more work on some of the more advanced tactics. But the fact that when his friend comes over, he says, hey, let's sit down. I want to play this with you. Uh, it just awesome. makes me a proud gamer dad. No, that's an awesome moment. I, 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 my kids haven't done that much, but I do remember Gwen having a friend over teaching Mr. Fox. So this goes back a few years. Nothing as complicated as DC, but <laughs> being like, there you go. Show, her some, show him some real games. Yep. Uh, so that's it for our past week. Uh, nice and short this week. Uh, we're going to take a moment, take a look at the less shame, more game pile of shame count. So during the Pento Suite after show chat last week, I did an unboxing of a package that showed up during the week. That ended up being a copy of the Shadow Veil expansion for Valeria Card Kingdoms, uh, something I kickstarted last year that shows up. So that's going to put the count up by one. I've also got a box here that I am going to open during tonight's after show. So, those of you who are live, you're welcome to stick around and watch that content. And no, I'm not going to give away what it is right now. So, with those two, the piles grow, obviously. But both Labyrinth and Totally Liquid were new plays to me this week. Now, Sean already bumped up the number one during the after show last time, so the Valeria expansion means it's an overall drop of one, which brings us to 69. The Pile of Shame. All right. So now that we've talked about what we played since the last episode, is there anything you're excited to get to the table next week? Well, I got my hands on the Birds of Prey crossover pack, which mm. is another little small, uh, you know, it's only 32 cards, I think. Uh, nice. and, my and my daughter is really looking forward to the chance to have, you know, an all-girls battle, both heroes and villains. Uh, and I actually just got notification that I may, it may come in before <laughs> uh, the end of the week, but uh, you connected me with Mass Drop in order yep. to get the Cartoon Network crossover uh, box, which is a uh, two-game pack, which is uh, another part of the Cerberus engine, but for the Cartoon Network characters. 
So what that I'm, may be that may make it to the table before. Awesome. I'm really curious to know how well that combines with DC. Like supposedly Cerberus, you can do it. Like that's the one thing I want to do is I really want to fight Bilbo versus Batman at some point, just because <laughs> you can, and I think that would be hilarious. Like back in the Hero Clicks days, I once had a fight with Spider Man versus a Klingon bird of prey, just because you could, and I had to do it. So, right. so what about you? What are you looking forward to playing? Well, due to non-linear podcasting, I know you can look forward to hearing about Masters of Orion, the board game, and The Ninth World, a skill-building game set in the world of Numenera next week, since that's already actually happened for me on Monday. But that'll be next week's show. But for future plans, I gotta admit, what I really want to do is I want to play Shadows of the Demon Lord. Shadow of the Demon Lord. I, well, run Shadow of the Demon Lord. I, I was really impressed by what I read. And I am strongly considering the first expansion book. Actually, it's a done deal as of today. I wrote the notes earlier today since then I started reading it. So I'll admit, I've already started reading Demon Lord's Companion, which is the first flat book for my March RPG a month book. So I am I am really looking forward to, to trying to play Shadow of the Demon Lord. I just don't know where I'm going to find a group. I don't know if I should try to push it to my Monday night group or what. I don't know if we're going to fit it in this may not not be next week but i do i want to play that game it sounds really good so we're nearing the the end of the show here i want to take one final stop by the lobby and see what's up well not too much going on i know Anchi games is upset that the uh stamina revision that we uh we discovered yeah, in the gloomhaven one. one that's a that's a real pain yeah. um Everyone, we had a little bit of chat about uh, if you if you want to have a coffee, you need a side table when you're playing that totally liquid expansion because there's just no room left on the <laughs> table. Uh, that I is shared true. I shared your Twitter uh, your Twitter pick of that uh, that that game cool. and uh, uh, Angie Games was noticing that uh, you managed to fit the entire game into one box, sort of. Sort of, <laughs> yeah. It didn't quite. There's, there's a bit. It didn't quite fit, but it's still better than two full boxes. They're yeah. back there. You might be so, able to see the small gap at the bottom. So what I, what I found um, when I was looking into it is, the the people who are making all the inserts for it mm -hmm. are saying that you can fit it all into one box, but it's the key is there's stuff in there that you don't need. Um, so I guess when you put both boxes together. You've got extra, and I and I, I I'm forgetting uh. what it is, but there's stuff in there that's redundant. You've got too many dinosaurs or something. Um, okay. So you can you can pull that out, and then it just fits. Interesting. Now, like I know, I already pulled out everything that I have Kickstarter versions of. So there's a whole bunch of stuff like uh, with Totally Liquid. I talked about the eggs and the and the goats. It, well, in my version, I have little plastic eggs and little plastic goats. Like I pulled out the cardboard ones, and for the fifth player tokens, I pulled out all the fifth player tokens that have been replaced by plastic meeple, and I pulled out the CEO token. So I pulled out all that. If that's what they're talking about, I don't know. I, no, I, I believe that I believe like the total dinosaur count is actually more so than high. you can use, and something like weird. that. There's, yeah, it's things like that where you've just got right. more than you need. I don't know. I it almost. I gotta admit that game feels like it needs an insert. I just don't know if I like it enough to spend another. The inserts aren't cheap. I like. Yeah, them, there was but most people. Most people were designing their own, just doing the foam thing. Yeah, I should split it over two boxes. I don't know if, if I find there's one of the the totally liquid expansions I don't like. Maybe I'll just pull that out. But for now, it works. It fits on the shelf. I just don't. I can't stack anything on top of it, or I might damage something. It's got to go on the top of one of the piles. Right. Now, a quick shout-out and thank you to our patron backers. Their support helps make this show possible. Misdirected Mark, join Phil, Chris, Bob, and Camden every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. the Queen's time, as they talk games and games mastering. Brian Kurtz, good to see you tonight, and thank you. Duran Barnett, thanks. Joe Swick, thanks for joining in on the Discord, and thank you. Jeff Seuss, thanks, Jeff. William Fisher, thanks. Diane Tuzano. Thanks, Ma. Danielle Thomas. Thank you, Danielle. P.S. Goujon. Glad you found us. And a big, big welcome to our latest patron, Andrew Dacey. And also one shout out to our new sponsor, Quiver Time. Thank you for showing your support. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek under guild number 3347. Drop by our website, tabletopbellhop.com, for more gaming content. 
Now, if you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thanks for joining us. Hang around and join us in the penthouse suite for the Off the Books After Show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.